Uh, welcome back. Today we want to introduce the uh, mechanisms by which materials fail, and this is important both that you understand the processes so you have some idea of why um, we do what we do to materials to improve their properties. Also, we're going to look at what the surfaces of failed components look like if they have experienced any of these processes. And that's helpful if you're trying to diagnose the source of a failure in a product or a system that you're engineering, um, or you have a product that's returned and you want to understand why it failed. And so these are our objectives. So we begin with just a general description of macroscopic fracture, macro meaning large scale. When you look at a broken component, you can generally categorize the failure in broad terms as brittle or ductile. And a brittle material is not going to show very much uh, necking or a uh, significant change in the geometry away from the fracture. Um, in, a, in a tension failure, a brittle failure will be flat like this. And if you get a, a photograph, you can see faceted surfaces. And again, no necking, um, no significant distortion away from the fracture area. At the other extreme, you'd have a very ductile material where in tension, in particular, you may get the tremendous necking and drawing down, but in general you can expect to see the cup and cone fracture that you've been observing in the lab experiments as you did tension testing on, particularly the aluminum bra and brass, which are very uh, ductile materials. Now that's macroscopically, just looking at a failed component, uh, you can often categorize it as either brittle or ductile. That doesn't necessarily mean you understand the micro um, process or the microscopic process which has produced the failure you do have the general category or, or family probably for that process. So the first question is why do materials fail? And we can do some theoretical kind of calculations and from those theoretical calculations it can be shown that the strength of a material ought to be approximately the modulus of the material divided by pi. Now it turns out real materials are anywhere close to that. The, the best form of materials that we can make, that is uh, the strongest versions of a, a given material are going to be fibers. And even in silica fibers, which is about the best material it's possible to make, the actual modulus um, to uh, failure stress ratio is 4, not 3.14159. So um, we're close, but it turns out that um, we're still not you know, at the theoretical level, it's going to be, the strength is going to be less than the theoretical value. But for most materials, this number is way off, and, um, and these are all wire steel, still, I'm sorry, um, except for the Osform steel, doesn't have to be wire, but th the point here is, these are ideal materials, is almost as close to perfect as we can make, and we don't get anywhere near the theoretical strength that they should give us. And the reason for that is defects. And the problem is we cannot make defect-free materials. Um, one of the things that's exciting about uh, nanomaterials is that when you build materials an atom at a time, it is uh, much more likely that you're going to be able to build a defect-free uh, macro material if you're working with such small building blocks. But that's the hope. That has not yet obviously come to pass. Um, but that's the hope of the nanotechnology. So failure always... Um, has two stages, and failure is going to initiate usually at a defect. Okay, and so that defect may be a surface crack or scratch, it may be an inclusion, it may be a stacking fault or a grain boundary flaw, something, all kinds of things. Something local is going to initiate a crack, and then that crack is going to propagate. And so when we try to prevent failure, we can attack the failure process at either of these stages. We can either try to prevent formation of cracks, or we can prevent cracks from growing once they form. And both approaches are appropriate. Um, the general approach in most mass engineering, when you're engineering automotive parts or appliances or whatever, is to use an initiation approach. We try to prevent cracks from starting. But when you're dealing with very high cost structures or high risk structures like airplanes, like bridges, maybe uh, pipelines, uh, valuable things like turbines, where replacement is very expensive, then we are going to look at trying to, uh, we, we can't prevent the flaw from being present, we can't even necessarily prevent the formation of a crack from that flaw, 
but we can prevent propagation and we can monitor propagation. So we'll see a change in strategy as we try to deal with this. But any part that fails is going to fail by formation and growth of a crack. The crack must initiate somewhere and then it's going to grow. Those are always going to be stages in the process of failure. Now, there are in uh, some general categories of uh, failure mechanisms. In metals, we have brittle fracture, and there's three subdivisions for brittle fracture, and not including variations of these that are assisted by the environment. So um, we're going to talk about cleavage or transgranular fracture, intergranular fracture, and fatigue, but know that in different environments, cleavage may become easier, intergranular fracture may be enhanced, fatigue fracture may be easier, may change um, uh, its basic uh, process. So environment will complicate these um, if you really get into the details of these processes. And then metals can undergo ductal fracture, and that's going to involve, at least locally, some fairly large amounts of yielding, lots of plastic deformation. Ceramics really only undergo brittle fracture. They're doing, there are not really, there's no ductal failure mechanism for ceramics. Um, they can be less brittle, they can absorb more energy, but the basic mechanisms are very similar. They're going to look like cleavage, so you may get intergranular fracture on uh, polycrystalline ceramics, and they, they're going to be subject to fatigue. Now today we're not going to talk about fatigue, we'll focus on that next week, but um, I want to class it here so that you know where it fits. It is a brittle fracture, that means if you come to a broken part that is a brittle failure, and it's a metal, you have three possible mechanisms that could have produced that macroscopically brittle failure. Um, if it's obviously a ductal fracture, lots of deformation, you're probably only looking at ductal fracture as the final mode of failure. So let's look at these. So for cleavage is a brittle transgranular fracture. That will be this type 1 fracture that goes through the grains. It does not follow the grain boundaries. It crosses through the grains, so we're cleaving them, therefore the term. Also called transgranular because the cracks grow across the grains like a transcontinental railroad goes across the continent. Now cleavage only occurs in BCC and HCP metals. It is not a fracture mode in FCC materials. And the reason for that is cleavage requires um, a saturation and the inability of the material to continue to yield. And FCC materials of course can yield all day and, and dislocations can go like crazy and so um, they are generally not subject to cleavage or brittle transgranular fracture. So the steps are you have a defect or some local stress riser that's going to cause the local stress to be elevated and we're going to get yielding around that defect and those dislocations are going to accumulate on that defect like a big traffic jam until there's so many of them that we can't put any more on and they initiate a crack. And the crack starts and then it's going to propagate. And that's the three stages, initiation due to dislocation pileup and then propagation uh, on, from a defect. Now, how do you know you're looking at cleavage? Uh, classically, cleavage shows river patterns. Um, there's also some hackle patterns that you may see. Uh, but uh, the cleavage feathers you see shown here. But the river pattern is just one of the most conclusive bits of evidence that you're looking at a cleavage fracture. As cleavage cracks cross grain boundaries, um, they change direction. There will be some um, change in their aspect ratio as they cross the boundary. You'll see these facets, and um, you'll also get branching of the cracks. Usually happens when they strike an inclusion or defect. And if you look, what's happening is the crack is propagating on parallel planes, but they're offset sometimes by just a few atoms of thick layer here. But they're all parallel planes, usually close packed planes. And the rivers that you see are the step for that, uh, those, those two parallel planes. And so that's what's going on in a cleavage fracture. Now, here's a picture of a cleavage fracture, and you see there's the river patterns. Okay. Now, where does cleavage start? It starts at second phase particles. Now, particles are really good at resisting initiation if they don't affect the global stresses very much. Now that happens if they're small, if they're spherical, and if they're well bonded. Well bonded means we think about stress being transmitted through all the bonds in the material. If the particle is bonded, that means stress can transfer through the particle, no problem. If it isn't well bonded, then stress has to go around it. It acts like a hole, and so the stresses right around the particle are going to be elevated. And you're going to, it's very going to be uh, going to be very easy to get yielding and dislocation pile up in these high stress regions. The absolute worst thing that could happen would be to have brittle particles 
at grain boundaries. And of course, where does nature like to put second phase particles? Probably most often at the grain boundaries. And they tend to be brittle. So if you want small particles that are spherical, that are well bonded, you have to pay attention when you process the metal. And this is often the difference between a high quality material and a low quality material. Their composition may be the same. The amount of defect, the amount of impurity that's present may be the same. But if they haven't paid attention to the size and distribution and the properties of the defects, um, you have an inferior product. So that's one of the things you look for as you look for um, a supplier, is who's, who's doing the most to maximize the uh, value of the material by minimizing the defect uh, problems. Propagation of cleavage cracks mostly is going to run on close packed planes. And because of that, as you cross grain boundaries, it has to reorient. The crack has to turn to line up on those close packed planes in the neighboring grain. And that costs energy. That, that rotation in the stress field is not easy, or is a little more difficult. So the more grains you'd have to cross, the, the more resistant the uh, material is to cleavage propagation. Also, second phase particles that are really small and spherical help resist propagation. So what do you want to do? You resist cleavage with a fine grain structure, and you control the defect populations. Ideally, you eliminate the defects, but total elimination is not possible in most materials at any reasonable cost. So um, you're going to try to make sure they're just not bad defects. They're not the wrong kind. OK, the second kind of brittle fracture is intergranular, and the crack runs between the grains. And so what's the type 2 there? And when you look at an intergranular fracture, it's pretty obvious. You see the chunks. These are the individual crystals. And we're seeing the boundaries exposed. And this happens because something has gone wrong with the grain boundaries. You should not normally, in a healthy material, to use a biological idea, see intergranular fracture. The bo grain boundaries are not that much weaker than the crystal grains. A crack having to turn uh, a, a great angle through a great angle to go around um, other grains that is uh, very difficult. Um, that if the material, if the boundaries are healthy, the crack would rather run straight through a grain than turn. So the reason it does this is this is very definitely the path of least resistance. The grain boundaries are heavily degraded, and so the crack grows easily. And so we're looking at a surface here. You see the chunks of the grains, and notice there's more cracking into the surface as the boundaries between these grains have also failed. Uh, that just screams out that this is intergranular failure. Something's gone wrong with the grain boundaries. And there's a couple things. You could have impurity segregations in some alloys. You could have uh, the combination of a corrosive environment and stress, which tends to induce this. Um, hydrogen will embrittle the grain boundaries, and it can induce this. So, but generally speaking, we're talking a chemical breakdown of the boundaries preceding the crack, and that makes it easy for the crack to go around the grains. Now. That's our two basic brittle fracture mechanisms. We'll talk about fatigue next week. Uh, ductile fracture involves a void nucleation growth and coalescence process. And it's going to produce a really fun surface, a dimpled surface like this. From your tensile bar, you have been watching in lab uh, the neck formation. And what's going on inside that neck in the tensile bar is um, you develop a three-dimensional stress state in here, if you think about this. This material is now narrower than what's outside the neck, which means as the material outside the neck pulls on the neck, it's pulling at an angle. So there's a sideways component to the stress. If you pull at an angle, there's a vertical component and there's a sideways. That means we have a tri triaxial or hydrostatic stress that develops in this neck because of the reduction of area. Well, if you have a little defects, and you see defects here in this fracture surface, the little balls that are inside the holes, those defects are usually hard materials that are not particularly well bonded. And when you start pulling in three directions, the metal pulls away from those defects, making voids. As those voids grow, they coalesce into a large crack. And then that crack grows by a shear process. And it forms these shear, or it's called slant fracture. Um, and that produces then your cone on one side and the cup on the other that you've seen in the lab. Now, this slant fracture is also ductile fracture. But it happens under shear stress, and so you don't see the large voids. The voids are there, but they're very small, generally not visible, um, except with some really high power uh, microscopy. So that is ductile fracture. Now, what's going to prevent formation of those voids? Well, 
If the second phase particles crack, bang, we've got a void. If the second phase particles are not well bonded, the metal pulls away. So what we really want is we'd like the particles to kind of have similar properties to the metal if possible, and we'd like them to stick, and you know, we'd like them to be strong so that they don't break. So you're going to control the particle size, their shape, their strength, their adhesion, and you're going to try to eliminate them as much as possible. By doing this, you prevent the formation of the voids. And remember that the ductile failure initiates with void formation. So if I prevent the voids from forming, then we can draw this and draw this, and the neck can get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so very super pure materials, you can get tremendous draw ratios and shrink that neck uh, to very small fractions of its original diameter. As the material gets dirtier and dirtier, you're going to nucleate more and more voids more easily. And so you're going to get the crack formation here at a lower and lower amount of contraction in the neck, and you're not going to get as much ductility out of the material. So we want to eliminate these impurities, again, not because we're worried about cleavage, but to prevent ductile failure, okay, in this case. If materials strain harden a lot, then that's going to tend to stabilize those voids, keep them from growing. Um, and if you can keep your dirt particles at low levels and spread them out a lot, you're going to have to make you're going to make the voids grow a lot. And again, that's going to allow for a lot more ductile deformation before the voids start meeting up and forming a crack. So the goal is to delay the formation of voids and then delay the those voids growing into a crack, which is going to cause failure. Now, when we talk about fracture. Uh, and a growing crack, we need to recognize that there are three modes, three kinds of stress that can cause a crack to grow. Mode one, because we're engineers, this is real creative. Mode one, opening mode. Mode two is a sliding mode to cause the crack to grow. And mode three is called a tearing mode. And the most common mode for uh, brittle fracture is going to be mode one. But as we look at ductile fracture, in a mode one situation, the voids are going to be basically symmetric. So when I look at the two broken surfaces, they look the same. If, however, we have off-axis stresses, then the, it, it, with respect to the growth of the crack, we're going to get slanted voids, and the surfaces may not be symmetric. Um, and so different stress states will produce different features. Uh, for example, in mode one, the dimples are symmetric, and when I put the two surfaces down, they're basically um, symmetric or mirror images of each other. However, in mode two, the dimples are slanted, and so when I look at these surfaces, the dimples have different orientations. And so you can look at a failed component and see where the, the external loading went from mode one to mode two based on how the fracture surface features change. This is really helpful in forensic analysis. We want to want to understand what started a fracture, what drove the continued propagation of the failure, what was happening to the structure as the thing propagated, and so on. It's very good in accident reconstruction. Other important markings that we can pull from the surface um, are chevrons, and that's these kind of uh, hackle structures. And they tell us where the crack started. So the crack starts here to the left, and it propagates. And in its propagation, it leaves behind these chevron marks, and we can reconstruct um, and find the source of a failure, which is often a really important uh, feature. Now, as we think about what causes failure, we've already hinted at um, the importance of the stress state. Shear stresses are going to induce plastic deformation, right? It's shear stresses that cause dislocations to move. Ductile failure is driven by shear stresses. Ductile failure will happen on planes where there is a lot of shear stress. And so, um, we'll see in class, we're going to talk about how you interpret um, from a global failure perspective whether the primary loading was, sh was a shear or normal. But understand, ductile failure is primarily shear stress driven. Uh, normal stresses open cracks and cavities, and so brittle failure is almost entirely a normal stress driven phenomenon. So I have a crack, if I pull open the crack, it grows much more easily than if I try to shear it. And we'll play with paper in class. Um, you'll see this, but if you take a piece of paper and put a tear in it, it's easy to grow the tear if you load it in mode one, but try to grow it in mode two, and you'll see that's quite difficult. Um, and it's because the paper's tearing in a fairly brittle fashion, and so it would much rather grow in a mode one mode than in, uh, in the shear mode. All right, so what kind of fracture are we looking at here? If you answered intergranular, 
You're correct. You see the chunkiness. You also see some cracks in the surface that suggest that the, the, the grain boundaries that are growing into the surface are also failing. There's cracks here. Okay, all of those suggest a breakdown of the grain boundaries. And what kind of fracture is that one? All right, if you said ductile, then you're right on the nose. Again, voids, you see holes here in the surface. This is a heavily voided surface, lots of small defects, ductile fracture. Now, your book doesn't really talk about this, but I'd like to introduce you to um, fractography of ceramics. They are brutal materials, and they have their own terminology. We're not going to cover all of the terms, but there's some really powerful uh, tools that we have when we work with ceramics and we're trying to analyze the failures. The first thing is that polycrystalline ceramics, you can have failures that look a lot like what we see in metals. So on the left, you have intergranular fracture, and that's, yeah, that makes, looks like intergranular fracture. There's all the grains, right? On the right, you have a cleavage fracture of a similar uh, material. Okay, and so we see there's a little evidence of grain boundaries. There's a hint of intergranular here, but this transgranular going through the grains, okay, and it's a cleavage fracture in the ceramic. Now, most the most interesting stuff is uh, is related to, to glass, and one of the helpful things is that when you look at a piece of broken glass, you can tell um, the strength of the glass based on the crack pattern. If you have a lot of cracks and a lot of crack branching, then it's a high strength glass, or it's a glass that failed at a high stress. And if it has very few branches, then you're looking at a low strength material. So um, all glasses are not the same, and the uh, crack pattern will tell you if you're looking at a high, medium, or low strength material. Now let's take a glass rod and bend it until it breaks. So you see there's the curvature. So we're looking at the fracture in the rod. And glasses have a characteristic structure in uh, fractures many times. There's a mirror region here that's very smooth. And then you can see faint dots in this region. And that is, that's called the mist region. And then these are called hackles, these radiating lines. And there's several kinds of hackles. In this case, they're just velocity hackles. Um, there are some other varieties we'll look at in a moment. But, and a hackle is a hackle. If you said that's a hackle, that's probably good enough. But the mist region is very special because it turns out that if you measure the radius of the mist region and you know a constant, and every, every glassy material has a constant, A, the radius of the mist region is related to the applied stress when the crack formed through that constant, A. So you could rearrange this as R to the 1 half over A is equal to the stress. So if I know this constant from my material and I measure this radius, I can tell you exactly what the stress was when this crack started. So that's a pretty nifty trick. Here's data for a number of different materials. And so some of these are ceramics. Some of these are glassy polymers. Um, but uh, what we find is that the mirror radius and the, mirror and the fracture stress fits on a line um, for di several different materials. Notice you know, these are a bunch of different stress levels for the same material. And so there's a constant. That's the slope that relates this radius to the fracture stress. So that's pretty cool. And you can look up those parameters. We'll do one in class where I'll give you that parameter. OK, when you have impact glass, uh, impact fracture of glass, you, you're going to see these things. And these are often visible to the naked eye. They're called Walner lines. And it's tempting to think, oh, this is where the crack front is at various points in the process. They are, in fact, not related to the crack front. They tell you the direction, okay, because they're going to be concave around the origin. So you know the crack is growing from down here in the lower left, and it's growing out because of their shape. But they're actually caused by interactions of um, sonic waves or oscillations bouncing in the material between the surfaces as the crack propagates. And those waves cause slight deflections in the propagating crack. Then you get these periodic kind of lines where the deflections occur. So they're called Walner lines. The key here is the concave side is always where the origin of the fracture is. This is where you're going to go look with your SEM to find the mirror mist hackle region, you hope, that will let you identify the stress that started this uh, fracture. Now when you do a uh, fracture of a glass plate, um, this would be in flex. And so the top we had in compression, the bottom's in tension.
These are Walner lines. The failure started down here at the bottom and propagated that way. That's what the Walner lines tell me, even though I, they don't tell me the front at any moment. And then these are called twist hackles. Um, if you just said hackles, that would probably be fine most of the time. Um, they are actually slightly different because they don't radiate the same way that the hackles from a mirror mist hackle failure do. But those are called twist hackles, and they just look like hackles. Now, the other thing that can happen is because glasses are so fracture sensitive, you can have multiple origins. And so here, you see a double origin. There's two mirror regions here. The, obviously, the impact that caused the fractures here, but two different cracks started from that and took off. And they merged, obviously, in the final failure. But two origins there. Cool stuff. And so that compl completes our um, discussion of fracture mechanisms. My uh, expectation of you is that if I throw up images, which will happen on exams and on quizzes, of uh, fracture surfaces, that you will be able to identify the feature, um, at least from this list. There's many, many more, um, but this is, in fact, an introductory class, so we don't want to throw too many at you. All right, so we'll talk in our next lecture about uh, fracture mechanics and how we actually predict failure uh, on the growth of cracks. Till then, have a good day.